Why don't you guys come in the front? Everybody wants to be a bad venture. Come, come. Yeah, very good evening to you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this uh, event, the launch of this book, Battle Coach by Padia. Such a pleasure to have you, Mr. Ram. And before I start, uh, we set a small context why this event is but it's relevant to take to a school like sorry. But the context is two conversations very coincident this morning. One is uh, a conversation initiated by Mr. Such say. Second is my first being part of the first conversation with Pine. A very interesting question posed by Anil was. What do you think is the meaning of the logo of soil? As always, he caught me. And, and one of the take homes for me of what the meaning of the logo of soil can be summed up in three lines, which is S O I L. So I learn. So I leave and so I live. Profound as it may seem, the most common factor in all these three, and if you notice, I am careful not to use the word coaching here. The relevance okay, of guidance, someone helping us navigate okay, through life become good leaders, which is facilitated by lots of learning. And in that context, the launch of this book and the conversation around that will hold a lot of meaning to all of us here, especially the students. The second conversation was with Paddy. Brief as it was, I was expecting a lot of conversation about sports and cricket. But I must say I was I was I was blown away because it was about a much larger purpose. But more of it from Paddy himself and maybe a little more from Ali. We have a very distinguished Set of analysts. Much as Anil Sachdev is also the host, but we insisted that he be part of the panel. Who else? One of the most distinguished coaches, well known in the industry, and, and therefore, before I request you to set the perspective, let me introduce all of them. Let me start with. Paddy, Paddy Captain, as you are aware, okay, the head coach of the international T20 cricket, acclaimed speaker, and what I didn't know, he was also a university professor and a mind conditioning coach of professional athletes. And his work transcends not just cricket, but every other sport, ranging from rugby, 
the soccer, the hockey, hockey too, Olympians, surfers, golf, and and today he's going to give us an insight into this unique line of thinking. And and this is going to be a memoir of sorts, possibly. Is it about stories? Possibly. But but I think it is more about this journey, this world of mind or leading to performance. I mean, like I said, the founder of one of the earliest consulting companies in India, the Aisha Consulting Services, followed by Rotalent Talent and the founding of the, sorry, the School of Inspire Leadership. Very early, he brought in AD Kathy to India and, and later on, okay, he was the managing partner. He also was part of the strategy consulting firm SDG, where he was the CEO of this firm in 2001 before he founded Rotary. Well known in the industry, but more importantly, our dear founder. Mr. Yogesh. Unlike, well, he's on the board of soil, yes, but he's also a serial entrepreneur and a promoter of nuclear software, and more importantly, a product of IIT Delhi. He's been the president of IIT Delhi Alumnus Association in 2006-2007, and he has been very actively involved in mentoring and coaching the startup ecosystem. Of Ivy. Anita Gupta, again, a master coach of the International Coaching Federation, and, and she has tremendous experience both as a leader in the industry and also as a coach of peaceful leaders. Most of them are well renowned in the country today. Welcome. Thank you all okay, for accepting to be our family members. I would also like to welcome the people from the industry, the students. And the theme today is, just to say, find by Anil, high touch, high performance. But more of it in terms of perspective setting by Anil. I request Anil to set the perspective. Thank you very much and welcome to this time and to this space. Paddy, you've done us a huge honor by choosing to be here. Anita, Yogesh, my fellow colleagues, and thank you everyone for us investing your time with us. I really don't want to come between you and others, but there are three important questions which I will ask many as I will change my life. The first question how do you experience others? The second, how do you experience, how do they experience you? And the third, most profound question, how do people experience themselves in your presence? In the presence of the chairman of our board, Mr. Kevin Noria, who is these days known as the father of Dr. Nitin Noria, the first Indian to become Dean of Harvard. In his presence, we feel like smiling for no reason. Leaders who worked with him when they committed even a blunder, they would go into his room and come out of that feeling stronger and inspired to do better. And there are some leaders in whose presence who feel diminished. So, how do you experience yourself in other people's presence? What kind of leader are you? So these are some extremely thoughtful questions. When I was asked this, I think it changed my life many years back. So I just want to present these. You know, I just uh, love just a very short conversation with Daddy. I think it appeared to me as if uh, he was trying to look 
beyond just the form and beyond the excuse of uh, the scope to really go deeper inside to who am I, what am I here for, and what are we collectively here to endeavor for. So I think um, these are just opening uh, remarks. We have limited time, so may I turn to Paddy and say, Paddy, uh, help us with whatever emerges from your source and what would be relevant. Thank you very much for the invitation um, to be here, to come and share with you, to come and have an exchange of ideas and thinking and, and energies. Um, I think maybe I'm, I'm just going to simply start with the exact same thing that I start saying to any cricket team that I start working with. Um, and I will, I'll speak to you as if I'm speaking to the cricket team but translate this to be relevant into your context, as you will do throughout the conversation. But I say to the players that I do not see any of you as cricketers. I see you as human beings first. One of the things which you happen to do as a human being, apart from all the other things, is you happen to play cricket. I also do not each one of you, cricketers, and each one of you sitting here, the skills that you have, the cricketers I work with are professional cricketers, the skills that they have and the talent that they've got was something they were gifted at birth. So I do not see talent as an accomplishment. And I encourage players not to see their talent as an accomplishment. It's a gift. The work that they put into translating that gift to translate that into success, that they can take some credit for, but only some. Because there's a lot of people along the way who have helped those cricketers, and as is the case with you, to get you to where you've got to today. And I get them to pause for a moment and go and reflect and even write down who are the people who contributed to you getting to where you've got to today. And I encourage them actually after the meeting to go and thank those people if they wish. For being there. And the other thing that I don't say to them initially, but I think is really important, is what happens with celebrities, certainly in, in cricket, in music, in Bollywood, and it happens in business for very, very successful people. The world around them treats the cricketers that I'm involved in, treats them as special people. And the problem starts happening is when they start thinking they are special people and behaving as special people. And I remind them that they are very ordinary people with a very special talent. And it takes working on themselves as human beings to the same degree that they work to improve their cricket talent, they need to work on themselves to ground themselves as human beings. And when they become really great human beings, a great human being who has a great talent, that is where, for me, sporting greatness happens. And I use the names of people like BBS Laxman, or particularly Rahul Dravid, for me, who is a true great, because he's a great sportsman, but he's an even better character and human being who's got his values and principles firmly in place and does not wait for them. So for me, that's really what I haven't come here to talk cricket, but cricket is part of the story that we can learn to teach us even greater lessons in life and leadership. I look forward to the conversation as we go. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Soy, for inviting me to share this space with people like all of them, including you all. So, really, really happy to be here this afternoon. Um, I guess taking forward from what Andhra as well as Kadi said, it's about each of us as individuals. And we understand we have to be self-aware about ourselves. And then we dream, just like a company dreams and creates their own vision statements. If we were to create that for ourselves individually, where do we want to see us go to 10 years from now? And then work backwards and say, what do we now need to do from now up until five years and then the next five years? So we create an action plan for ourselves. The key is really to be able to make sure that we understand ourselves. So the learning about ourselves is what will really help us than somebody else telling us. 
so, especially the millennials all sitting over here. Um, how many of you love to be told what to do? None, right? No hands went up. So, and if you were to be asked to say, how could you do this? You would enjoy doing that, I guess, much more, right? So, lots of nods there. So, coaching is really about a whole society changing its way of interactions. We typically have been told to do things by people, our parents, our teachers, our managers, everybody, right? Because they know, of course, and we have to learn from their experience. But the growth is higher if we have to figure out what is our potential and how to go there, supported by a person or a coach. So I just leave you with one small formula that I just love about this new concept, a new interaction language called coaching, which says performance equal to potential minus interference. Think about that for anything that you want to do. We have infinite potential. It's just some interference, some limiting belief. I cannot do it to this level. That stops us from doing something to our best potential. And if we are aware of it, we can work towards taking it out. And we learn something new about ourselves then. And we grow. So that's the personal mastery that you accomplish via so-called coaching. Um, so I'd like to leave it over there. I'm a rookie in the presence of Anil Paddy and Anita. I learned coaching just last week. <laughs> so, but I have been dealing with a lot of youngsters, a lot of startups for more than 10 years now. And after I learned coaching, I realized that whatever I was doing was all wrong. <laughs> I was acting like a mentor. They would come to me. And before they have even completed their issue that they want to discuss with me, I'll say, oh, I can think of three possible reasons or three possible ways you can handle this. More about the data, but coming back to its current context, I was browsing through Paddy's book. And right in the introduction, you have that you have described the experience of transforming, transforming a Horrendous with quotes character. Okay. Uh, so, in a brief background, he meets a person on the street who is a dreaded criminal known for murdering, and he's about you know he's holding him and probably you know, being violent with him. And whatever he did in that moment, the person just stopped everything. And that, as the moment I read it, it stuck to me, this is what Buddha did. Do you remember the story of Anguli Mal? How many of you remember the story of Anguli Mal? Okay, for the benefit of those who do not uh, remember it, Anguli Mal was a dreaded point. And any traveler he would find in a way, wherever he was, he would loot them, kill them, and Chop a finger and put the finger in a garland. And that's what Aguli is a finger and Mal is a mala. That's what he was known for. And Buddha was walking through that uh, jungle or that forest. And many people told Buddha, look, there's Aguli Mal there, so beware, you know, this is not the right way to go. And Buddha just continued. And as Buddha was walking, Aguli Mal, Aguli Mal shouted from behind, stop. So as they in Hindi, look chop. So Buddha just stopped, turned around without any fear, with his eyes, with a lot of compassion. He said, Vento Rukya, Tuka I have stopped, but when are you going to stop? And that one powerful statement is said to have transformed Amul Mal completely. Mal said it at the point. So as I was reading Paddy's book, that kind of a transformation, I think Paddy is seen and would like to hear more about it, both as a coach, as a person who is able to bring out the best in others.
timetable, then there will be of asking the first question to Paddy, and I'm sure if many of you have questions to, to ask from him and others. Uh, Paddy, uh, you know, what I learned a little bit in this subject myself is that uh, many times we have our own biases. And it appears to us that this person is getting stuck, is not going, because of what appears to us to be the person's issue. And yet, uh, I have been trying to teach myself to say uh, I have to go beyond my own biases to truly understand the way the person is and come and understand what that person is all about. So, would you like to share with us anything to do with this to say how do you prevent your own biases and perception about a person? You know, before you really discover who the person is. Thank you, Anil. What comes to me is actually a, a story that when Gary Kirsten and I came to India in 2008, Gary is the head coach of the Indian cricket team and myself, the position of strategic leadership coach and mental conditioning coach. And very briefly, we, Gary had never coached a cricket team in his life, not even his schools under 19. His first ever job was the biggest job in world cricket coaching one of the world's biggest sports brands. And I was sitting next to him flying in an aeroplane for him to come to this job where he was completely green. I'm in a novice. And the, the job of medical conditioning coach and strategic coach did essentially two complete novices coming to work with the Indian cricket team. And in hindsight, because we knew we didn't know anything about the job. We knew about cricket and about people. Um, we didn't know anything about Indians really in any great depth, and we didn't know anything about the Indian cricketers. So we arrived really with our eyes wide open, our ears wide open, and our mouths shut. We really needed to learn who were these people as individuals we were working with, and we really needed to learn this brand new culture. Well, I had some interactions, but it was so limited and near thin that I couldn't begin to assume that I knew anything about India and Indians. And we spent that three years, and when we left at the end of the three years, we were still in this mindset of, no, we don't know, so we need to keep learning. And the value only really came where we were then asked to come and coach the South African credit team a few months later. And Gary and I had the conversation, and we said, you know, our biggest weakness going to India was not knowing. But our greatest strength was knowing that we didn't know. Now that we're going to coach the South African team, and we know these players personally, our biggest weakness is the fact that we think we know these players, we think we know this team, and we think we know South Africa. And our challenge was to keep that mindset of we know that we don't know. And that was actually really difficult. So we were fortunate that actually we were thrust into a position where we really, really had to put our own biases aside because we actually didn't know enough even to have a bias. Very good. Very good. Thank you. A question from the audience. Yeah, please give your name and then ask the question. Uh, hi, Paddy. First of all, uh, I am I'm still blessed. I'm really surprised to see you personally because I saw you while you were coaching in India in 2011. You used to come on TV as well. So I used to watch it on television. Like that. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pleasant experience, really. Like, uh, so, the question question is like, uh, you, you spoke about uh, people like Rahul Raman, the US national. They, you used to uh, see them, that how good and great human beings they were. And uh, I suppose when 2011 World Cup occurred, uh, I missed the money, led the team to the victory. And I, 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 I believe that you have had good insight about what his thought process was, how he used to go about things and you know, manage the team. Can you just give a little insight about how we could also, like, because he's a role model, Course, for the whole of the nation and uh, why nation, the whole world, these are the role models. So I would like to understand like what would the 
Thank you. So, thank you for that question. So, one or two of the things that comes to mind as you ask the question is, I think one of Dodie's greatest strengths is, and we all know that, so I'm not telling you anything new, is his calm and composure under all different situations and conditions. That calm and composure not only helps his performance, but as a leader, it gives all of his team permission to be calm and composed. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean we all need to now lead from a calm and composed state. Because can you imagine now describing that to Virat Kohli, who he uses his visible emotional charge to drive his personal performance? One could go from a leadership position, and as Amil said earlier, and ask his players, how do you experience yourselves when Virat is over emotional? And I think we might find something that we won't necessarily place Virat's method of leadership in the text of good leadership, um, because I don't know that it necessarily influences others positively. Um, but to go to that 2011 World Cup, one of the, there was two things that stand out that we really took into that World Cup, because up until that point, no team had ever won a World Cup on home soil. And we assumed one of the reasons is because of the pressure. And there could be no greater pressure in world cricket than India playing a final at the Wankhede Stadium in Sachinton Dulka's last World Cup in front of his home crowd. It doesn't get bigger in the game of cricket. So we needed to prepare for that moment. And there's two things we did. Number one, at the beginning of the tournament, players were talking and we're having very honest conversations about the amount of pressure on players. And it was a pressure of probably half a billion people. And we transformed that thinking to say it's not the pressure of half a billion people on your shoulders or the weight or the burden of expectation. It's actually when you walk across the ropes, imagine that there's half a billion people holding your hand and walking with you to support you. So that changed the concept of burden of pressure to half a billion people support. The other thing we said during the course of the season that we really need to spread the burden of pressure. If we place all the pressure on MS Dhoni's shoulders, for example, he's a human being, at some point he won't want that pressure anymore and he will crumble or he'll go away. So we all need to spread the burden of pressure across the entire tournament. And actually we only need to experience a really high pressure at the end. So it was amazing that we got to the final, Virat Singh had ostensibly already got the, the Man of the Tournament um, award because of his performances. He was the informed player. At that point, Dhoni's high score was 35. He had not contributed very much at all to Team India's campaign. When we were two wickets down, and the next batsman in was the informed man in the tournament, Yuvraj Singh. Dhoni knew that that moment, that pressure, was when the real leader needs to stand up and be counted. And I'll never forget the moment I was sitting outside of the change room next to Gary Kirsten and every study was inside, he was not next in, you right was next in and then Tony was next. Tony never ever walks outside and sits outside um, before he comes into bat, he's always inside the change room. And we just heard a knock on the window and Gary and I turned and looked back and all Tony did, he knocked on the window and he went, no conversation, I'm acting next. I don't know to this day whether it was a question to his coach or a statement, but, <laughs> but Gary just nodded. Because MS at that moment knew that he was the man. And when he walked out to bat, I know a lot of people and a lot of commentators would have said, why on earth is Dhoni walking out to bat now for the first time ahead of New Raj Singh when he hasn't delivered a New Raj has? And while people were saying that, I turned to Gary Kirsten. I said, do you know what? As MS walked down the stairs of Wayne TV Stadium, I said, MS is going out there to get just the World Cup. Because when the time really comes to stand up as a leader and be counted, really great leaders recognize that moment and they stand up to be counted. Hello, good evening, Patrick. Uh, my name is Faraz. Uh, my question is that. 
See, we had in 2007 the Indian team which we had was pretty similar to the side which we played in 2011 as well. A lot of veterans were there, but there was a drastic change in the performance, and we know that in West Indies we have still done uh, very well as well. It's not that the ball swings a lot, and there's not much change in the conditions as well. There are a lot of dry wickets as well over there and in India as well, right? So what I wanted to ask is, what was the biggest change that we were able to perform so well in 2011 and reach the final and win the World Cup as well? And of course, mentally, how was uh, your and Gary's contribution to it, to the side? So I'm not quite sure of the real detail that went on within the Indian team prior to Gary and I being involved. Um, although Gary did go and meet the players before we officially started them, and there was one or two things that we got from the players. And the one thing was we inherited a fairly unhappy team. And the team was unhappy, which we learned from the players. They had had previously the coach was Greg Chappell, Australian who is probably the most pedigreed coach in the world at the time, who has now been replaced by come to be the least experienced international cricket coach. But what Greg Chappell, he had great knowledge, but the problem that he had created in the team was he imposed his knowledge on the players. Where Gary and I arrived now knowing from a coaching perspective and also from that feedback that we weren't there to impose anything on the Indian cricketers. We needed to collaborate and harness the collective intelligence or wisdom that sat within the group which meant asking way more than telling which Chapel had done. That was the first thing. Um, and the other thing that I don't know how relevant it was, quite frankly, but when we were sitting, Gary Curtis and I were sitting in a plane flying over to India, um, we sat down and we wrote four goals for the last three years of the team. Number one, we wanted to take India to the number one test team in the world, the position we hadn't got to. Number two, we wanted to win the World Cup in 2011, which that you hadn't done in 28 years, which are quite big goals for two complete novices, but you've got to set your goals high anyway. The third goal was we wanted to create a happy team environment. And those are two different things. I still to this day believe that happy people perform the best. And the other thing is we really wanted to work as a team. Because everyone does, but we needed to take India India's team work to a place that it actually never been to before. And historically, India was generally, there's a billion people here, and there's so many differences and so much diversity. You would expect more diversity than you do if you would expect team work. That's perfectly normal. Um, but the, and there was obviously one of the problems, and I think it still exists to a large degree in sports um, and in businesses in India, is you've still got the old school hierarchical command and control or authoritarian leadership in place where Juniors are expected just to be diligent little followers of instruction. That model of leadership and followership is it's defunct, although it is still in place in a lot of traditional businesses and in credit language. Um, but the last point we came up with is we wanted to help the Indian cricketers become better people. Now, we never ever shared that with anybody not the players, not anybody outside, just Gary and myself. And there was two main reasons we didn't share. Number one, we weren't employed by the BCCI to make the players better people, we were employed to make them more. But number two, what's probably the main reason is there's an element of arrogance in that. When we, actually, when we thought about that, is that who did we think we were to make other people better people? But still, we knew if we could get these superstars more grounded, more rounded, more wholesome as human beings, that would really underpin not only their performance and their consistency, but it would also set them up for more success in life beyond credit. And the equation for that is understanding is actually very simple. It's complex, but it's simple. If you want to build a really tall building, or you want to grow a really tall tree, the way you do it is you need to go down deep and really get a deep foundation and deep roots. And they're not really tested, those deep roots or deep foundations, if the wind isn't really growing or different, they aren't difficult times. 
But those deep roots and foundations really come into play during the high pressure moments and the difficult times. They help us weather a storm. Um, and then what it does do is creates consistency in performance. So what did we do differently? I'm not sure. Um, we used very much a sort of coaching approach, collaborative approach. Um, but it was a people first and performance was always second. So if someone did badly, we wouldn't jump in to correct the performance. The first thing we do is jump in to support them, because when someone makes a mistake, the first thing they need is an arm around them in support, especially when you make it in front of half a billion people. That's just something. Good panel. Uh, my name is Akshat. Okay, so this is one moment I have been waiting since 2011. I have dropped a lot of messages to almost all the creators with no response. So from the core of my heart, thanks a lot for the 2011 moment. Something we all cherish probably every time even is the replace. So thank you for that. Uh, I would stick more to your specifics and your domain. That is, Tony was captain in 2011. Now it was altogether a different scenario. Uh, playing for World Cup, a team which was an underdog, and somehow conditioned the entire team to play on single same, right? Now, now only being the new captain, and pretty much more than 50% of the team is the same that had played 2011 World Cup. Now, how does that change in captain and approach towards the game, as per you, should will or maybe affecting the entire prospect the team goes on the ground and plays the game? Um, Sure. I'm going to answer the question slightly differently. So, in order to win World Cup, and again, I invite you to translate what I'm saying to be relevant back into your context, because sport is a metaphor for life. And I don't think there is any sport that mirrors life better than what cricket mirrors life. Um, the team, if I talk about this upcoming World Cup now, the teams that have got the best chance of winning, number one, needs to have the right skills. If you don't have the right skills, they're not going to win the World Cup. Number two, once the right skills are in place, which the Indian team do have in terms of batting and fielding, the next thing you need is excellent preparation. It's just like walking into an exam, having studied the whole book, you go in with confidence and a good chance of doing well. If you've cut corners, you go in with hope. So, team needs to be exceptionally well to prepare to play against and beat every opposition on every one of the different pitches and conditions they're going to play at. Will the Indian team be prepared to beat everyone? Yes, they will. The next part they need is to have a belief in their skills and in their preparation. Um, and I don't like the concept of belief. And the, the Indian players who, who in this team who won the last World Cup, they will be one step ahead of those players who believe they can win. The players who won it before will know they can win. There's a very, it's a fundamental difference between believing something and knowing something. That's why the Australians do so well each time they play a World Cup, because they know what it feels like to win. Um, but the next thing that they need then is obviously, the team that wins is very simple. There's a lot of good teams in the World Cup. Whoever has team has the most number of players on form at the back end of the tournament during the finals will win. It's as simple as that. The leadership does play a part in that. It doesn't play a part in the skill because that's each individual's responsibility. The leadership in terms of Virat's leadership doesn't really play much of a part in preparing the players. That's largely up to the coach and the individual players to work together. In terms of the belief and the knowing and the mindset, that is where the captain does come in. But probably more importantly, as we hear in business, we hear the mantra that culture eats strategy for breakfast or culture before strategy. Having a really good team culture is created by the leadership. And if a team is winning, the culture is never tested and you will never really know. But when a team loses three or four games, and or they lose a key player, MS Tony gets injured, that's when the culture 
or the heart of a team is really tested. And the analogy that I use for the cricket team is it's like a ship. When you've got a really strong team culture, it's like having a strong, sturdily built ship. When you've got a Frank Benson team culture, like was publicly made during the uh, Calcutta Knight Riders team, there was an unhappy team and there was division, and that was publicly spoken about. That is a flimsily built ship. In the beginning of the IPL, Andre Russell was scoring a whole lot of runs by himself, so the, uh, the Calcutta was winning. As soon as they lost three games in a row, we knew they would not come back. Because it's effectively like this ship that's not very well built is now in stormy seas. We do not navigate stormy seas with a ship that's not really well built. Ship that's well built, and I'll take the Rajasthan Royals team that I coach, we had a very disappointing season. Halfway through, we were again at the bottom of the lot, but we were a very strong team with a great culture. I knew that we could weather the storm and still come through and still win towards the back end of the tournament. And take it back to Cody, the strength of the leadership between coach, captain, and senior players will determine how strong the team culture is that if the Indian team comes under really extreme pressure towards the qualifiers, the finals, the World Cup, which is almost always the case, that's when the leadership is really tested. And the reality is, you and I will see a team win or lose, and we actually won't really know to what degree it's the leadership. But, Cody's lucky that he has Dhoni support him. That's Is uh, you know, we've talked about mental conditioning and you utilizing your mental faculties to the core. Now, for an average Joe who's not necessarily uh, an athlete who might be working with the corporate, you know, who might be having his own business, so how is it that this average Joe can actually utilize his mental faculties uh, to the best of his abilities without having access to, let's say, a mental or a strategy coach? So, anything that you could sort of tell us, the average Joe, how we can do our best. Um, yes, thank you for that question. Um, in short, and I'm going to jump to what some of us might be thinking, and or read the article in the media about me saying Gautam Gambier was weak and insecure. Did anyone read that? Okay. So I'm going to answer it in terms of that question. Um, what I said in the book, and what was misquoted, um, was that Every single athlete, best athletes in the world that I've worked with, every single one of them, ex not every single one, except the out and out corporate psychopaths, and you get psychopaths in sport. Let's leave them aside. But for the rest of the majority of us, I've never worked with an athlete who is fully secure, has no doubt, has no vulnerabilities, and never has negative thoughts. Every single one of the best athletes in the world, unless they're a psychopath like Lance Armstrong, they have doubts, they have vulnerabilities, they have insecurities, and they have negative thoughts. The problem is when we label those things as problems, limiting factors. Is there anyone here in the last week or so who's had doubts, insecurities, vulnerabilities, or negative thoughts about yourself? By show of hands. All right. Every one of you put your hand up, welcome to the human race. <laughs> the, one of the problems that has emerged out of sports psychology, unfortunately, is we label people who have these things as mentally weak, as soft, as being fragile. And that in itself is the single biggest problem. Those things are perfectly normal. And what I've said in my book around Gambia is, Yes, he was full of negative thoughts, he was full of doubt, and he was full of insecurities. However, he did not label those as a problem, he did not allow them to drag him down. He took his insecurities, he took his vulnerabilities, and he took his doubts out onto the field with him, and he, got, he used them to make him focus on what do I need to do to get even better and know even more. He took them with. 
And that's the message and my answer to you is you do not need, nobody here needs to go and consult a sports psychologist or mental conditioning coach. Embrace your vulnerabilities, embrace your confidence, embrace your lack of confidence, embrace your doubt, embrace your knowing. Embrace everything that goes on, every thought experience. Be comfortable in who you are today. Be comfortable in what you know and in what skills you have. But at the same time, also be relentless in being better, knowing more, and upskilling. Because you can always know more and be better tomorrow. But be happy with where you are today. And drop these concepts that you need to be strong and you need to think positively all the time and you need to be fully confident. Be real, be authentic, own your experience and then say, right, what am I going to do right now to come to know more or be better? That mindfulness and meditation and everything, all of those kinds of practices and contemplative practices outside of the performance environment, the sport environment, those can teach you about what we need to be doing in this environment way more than what a sports economy is. This is Rashmin, and I'm very enjoying this conversation because it actually was a spur of the moment that I saw on his poster. So, I am actually going back to the original question, which I asked, it was very interesting that how do you handle? Um, biases when uh, we are coaching, and so I have a comment on that as I'm a coach myself, and then I would like you know, your comment on that comment. So, uh, one thing that I've found is that there will always be biases, there will always be uh, emotions in the coach when the coach is coaching. So, for example, uh, I was coaching a woman who had issues of time management and uh, when we went into the details, she shared that um, you know she would go at home and uh, there was she didn't like much cooking. She wouldn't go into the kitchen and her husband would need to come into the kitchen and there would be a big hangama uh, in the morning. And as I was listening to her, I found myself actually getting very angry with her. And my sympathies lay with her husband. And for me, this was a moment of reflection within myself that what was happening to me. That um, you know, I had this attraction and repulsion uh, for my client, and uh, so it actually becomes a trigger for self-reflection because uh, I'm getting a lot of information about myself, and in the service of the client, if I reflect, I can find that if I accept these feelings, then I'm able to help the client better. So, for example, I realized that I am very similar to her. And then I wonder whether I have forgiven myself for being like her. And that is where the anger was coming from. And the moment I reflect on this, then I'm actually more able to be present with the client. So I think that for me is an interesting way of dealing with the biases. So I wanted your reflections on this comment. <laughs> I think your reflections and your observation on what went on for you was amazing. I, I can't add to that other than to say that level of awareness and reflection, we can all find that in those, recognize that in that moment and have that level of reflection. Well, then we're all going to be damn good coaches. I think that's a beautiful example. Mr. Question. My name is Harish. Uh, is there a significant difference that you experienced when you're coaching a team environment or when you're coaching an individual? The context that I'm asking it from is from the corporate situation, where if you're a small startup and you've got guys at remote locations or working on their own, as different from people in a larger center of your of your setup where you would want three, four people and that kind of helps you get along a little easier. Is that different in individual sport versus a team sport? Yes, there definitely is a difference between the two. Um, and the key difference that I've found is coaching in an individual sport, all the complexity comes from within one individual. 
And in coaching them, one can go to much deeper levels of complexity working with an individual in an individual sport. In comparison, working with a team sport, because there's so many people, it's more difficult to go to the depth of complexity within an individual. However, the system in which they operate is largely the mental conditioner of that athlete's mind. So that's led me, and I talk about the book, I honestly believe the mental conditioner in a team sport, or the sports psychologist in a team sport, is actually the head coach, not the sports psychologist who's employed to work with the athletes. The reason being that the culture that exists within the environment is the strongest influences on people's mind because it influences their mind every moment and every day that they're within that culture. As a, I've been an external sports psychologist or mental conditioning coach in teams that I haven't been leading. I go in and there's a team of 15 people. I'm lucky if I get to see them for one hour every two weeks. So that conversation influences them for one hour. They go back into the team environment a day, five days a week two weeks so it's my one hour versus the team environment's 40 hours well who's going to condition or influence that person's mind so an individual we can coach them individually and working in a team i honestly believe that the coaching needs to happen at the level wherever the influence lies head coach captain or senior players the way they conduct themselves creates the culture and the culture that influences players mind are the positive one. Maybe just to add that, what are the what are the most significant influences? Yes. You you started your career with the South African team as uh, their fitness coach and you had the best of uh, career and best of life. And then you suddenly sucked everything and went on a long journey. And you know, how do these life experiences, you utilize them in coaching situations? So how do you use yourself as an instrument for uh, coaching? Um, I think there's two parts, the two things that come up when you ask that question. One is, yes, I was the fitness trainer of the South African cricket team for four years back in the 1990s, between 1994 and 1998. I worked at Bob Woolman, Hansi Premier. I was the, South Africa was the first team in the world that had a full-time fitness trainer, so I was lucky enough to be the first full-time fitness trainer in world cricket. And I was in my mid twenties then, traveling the world, meeting Mandela, meeting the Queen, living in five star hotels, um, meeting all the best cricketers in the world, Tendulkar and Lara and Ponting, etc. And I was really well paid. And I worked about seven months a year, seven and a half months a year, and I had about four and a half months paid leave where I go surfing. Pretty cool job in your mid twenties. <laughs> free Oakleys, free nights free everything, I would pay for the thing. Um, and at the age of 28, I resigned from that dream job and dream lifestyle. There was nothing wrong with the environment. I had no other opportunities to go to. I just knew deep within my core, that was probably one of the biggest change moments in my life. I had an emptiness. I didn't know what the emptiness was, I didn't know where it was coming from, and the emptiness drove me just to resign and move. And I spent the next six months with a backpack on my back, barely traveling around Southeast Asia on a budget of 80 US dollars a day for food, travel, and accommodation. Um, and I deliberately did that to really live the life of, of the common man and woman. And it was sometime during that journey but I was able to reflect back on my four years with the South African cricket team living a really high life. And I realized that I had been living in the playground of the ego. I'd been wallowing in the superficialness of the life of celebrity, of money, of the easy life. Um, and I'm not sure what I expected from that really good life and success and fame by, well, by association of me working with famous people. 
but it was really empty. And it was really that that got me to start going inward and say, okay, so if that really didn't fill me, I guess I thought it would. So what is it that I'm actually looking for? Because I had everything that I thought I needed or wanted, and it wasn't it. That's when I started the journey of going inward. I started to understand who am I and what do I want and what is life actually all about. Um, and I started then seeing people chasing the dream and chasing the goal and chasing fame and chasing money and chasing the next whatever it is. And I came to realize that that's not what I was wanting. I was wanting what I thought famous people had. I was wanting what I thought successful people had. And actually what those people had, all of us have got available to us today, which is contentment or love or freedom or connection or relationship or health, those things that really fill us from within, we don't find on the outside. So that was really the thing that brought about the change for me. Um, and I guess the more we do that and the more we connect with that ourselves, the leadership on coaching positions, we, we become the instrument of leadership and coaching. We actually just got to get ourselves out of the way and allow the work to happen and through really listening and paying attention and connecting. Quite philosophical that, but actually happened. Thank you. Thank you. So because we have short enough of time, I'm just going to ask Anita to just uh, reflect about what she got out of this experience and just share something about that. So, um, you know, I think when I read that book, the Mystery Event, I was amazed because this is the book that I could find which connected so beautifully everything to what I knew about coaching, which is not a whole lot, with how he has applied it to the world of cricket, which I thought I understand. But uh, just applying that basic philosophy of coaching into something that we have taken for granted to be sports coaching, the way that, you know, for the coaches, I forget the names, but the Shastri said that I did, right? So that was my understanding of sports coaches. Till the time that I read the book and really figured that what uh, he was doing, that he was doing, was actually what we're doing in leadership coaching and applying that into sports. And I do know that you know how to apply coaching skills into not just corporates but also in life coaching scenarios and individuals call it performance coaching, fitness coaching, whatever. But this was an amazing reflection and uh, truly showing the power of coaching, of how it's been applied. So and so brilliantly articulated. So I've enjoyed that. So thoroughly. So thank you so much for sharing experiences so with so much of humility and humbleness and vulnerability in the book, it was fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Rogesh, a uh, minute of your reflection. Thank you, Anil. Um, what I heard from Paddy, uh, Sanskrit, is really beautiful, is that sports being taught to us, it was to taught us when we have been training for extreme coaching. And one thing that I picked up from the book, if you permit me to share, as I was browsing through, I have not read the book completely, but uh, uh, I bought it about four days, five days ago uh, from Amazon. And before I could read it, my son picked it up and he has read the book from uh, uh, first page to the last page. As I was browsing through it, I found something very interesting. I found something about ego. How ego is beneficial and where that it transcends into a challenge that we need to master. And he has very vividly, very beautifully described it, sharing his own personal experience, being vulnerable and everything. And that was a very, very revealing uh, Chapter for me. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that uh, to me, I realize that uh, in the teaching from my spiritual teacher, Swami Chenman, who said, when you deeply love something, you rise in love, you transcend all your limitations. And he said to us, if you have a cause in your heart, 
make the world better and if you become the first follower of that cause, leadership happens to you. I just want to say that uh, whatever you said just resonated deep in my heart to say if you truly care, then you rise in love and then all your fears and limitations become the best follower. And I think somewhere in that team of 2011, we were all at the ground and we were all part of the experience. And before we went there, I made all of our students here visualize. We did a collective visualization of holding hands with the cricket team. And we visualized that these guys would pick up Sachin on their shoulders at the end. And India has the World Cup. And lots of us did this visualization. I'm on the board of a few companies. I made those board members visualize. And collectively, I think the whole of India was visualizing holding hands. So I don't know, you never told us to visualize. But that's how we were visualizing. And so when it actually happened, it appeared as if we had already seen it before. So I think the whole of the country came together. So let's hope one more time. I'm going to the World Cup. I'll be at post game. So <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll find a way to do some collective visualization with this batch of students before we go. Let's see what happens this time. Thank you very much. I think we have a the honor of having some of your energy for spreading and serving the well-being of others and once again thank you very much thank you we now have a formal book launch okay yes
Yes, okay. So that's a okay, for IT now. Can I may request the students to first uh, take the stairs and go to the cafeteria? Yeah, the books are available for sale outside, and uh, uh, Paddy has agreed to graciously sign the copies. How are you? Oh, nice to see you. It's so nice that you came here. That's an interesting event. Ah. <laughs> and after all, you have been practicing and learning and mentoring and coaching. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.